So we'll just start. All right, time to start. Okay, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, my old boss, our THC supervisor, Jack Greenblatt from the University of Toronto. He is here um, doing uh, a couple months sabbatical. He'll be with us um, until the end of the year, uh, hanging out in the second floor, kind of QBI space, we'll have an office for him there. Um, so it's great to have him here. And, uh, a lot of you, I think, are behoove you to interact with Jack, and I think Jack would get a kick out of interacting with a lot of you guys as well. So we're also going to do some creative things. Robin had an idea of doing this. Her and me and Jack. And uh, we're going to do a QBI TV with Jack Greenblatt and Bruce Albert. Back, back in the late 70s were two of the first, if not the, the two first characters that's pretty cool. Um, so Jack, a little bit of background. Um, correct me when I get a little wrong. But, uh, Jack did his PhD at Harvard for Walter Gilbert, the Nobel Prize winner. Also, I guess Jim Watson as well, right? He has these two labs where Jack worked. Back when lithobiology consisted of less, probably less than 100 labs in the world, Jack, something like that. Something like that. <laughs> With, in those days, you could read every paper ever published in molecular biology. Uh, so <laughs> after his PhD, postdoc in a uh, Pasteur, actually, Institute Pasteur for six months, and then also in Geneva. Yeah. I think he did Geneva first and then Institute Pasteur. Yeah. He going to Hale in Paris for a few months. And then in 1977, shortly after I was born, he started at the University of Toronto. And he's been there, I guess this is your 47th year. It's my 47th year too, but it's Jack's 47th year at the University of Toronto. And um, you know, over the years, Jack has really pioneered a lot of work, I guess, in, with respect to transcriptional regulation, especially in bacteria, looking at multiple termination, and then segueing to Human looking at general transcription factors, propagation, uh, and transcriptional formation. Uh, but also a lot of technology involved. Jack had a great gift when I joined his lab as a PhD student right through his time at the University of Toronto. And, uh, uh, so a lot of the stuff that happens around here, Jack should get some of the credit or some of the blame, I guess, depending on. Um, but the way I think of it as a scientist was um, inspired by a lot of Jack's um, mentorship. So Jack got really excited about systems biology, but it was important to connect that systems biology to mechanistic insight. In particular area, and that's that guy was transcriptional regulation. He it's important to generate a lot of information, but can extract insight from that. So today, Jack's going to be talking about um, set of transcription factors, P, PH2, ring finger transcription factors. He told me this morning that there are 1,600 of these. Or no, so there's 1,600 DNA bind transcription factors, but half of them correspond to this set of transcription factors. And he's been studying a couple hundred of them and maybe going into more detail in the 10 or so. Something like that. But he'll tell us about that. So thanks, Jack. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Len. That more or less summarizes what we're going to talk about. I had two important collaborators on the phone that said they were going to talk about the and then more recently. So, uh, why these proteins? So, this is an, uh, an older slide, and this shows kind of the number of these. Factors encoded by the genes compared to all the other classes. These are nearly half of all. At the time that we started these studies, um, it wasn't even clear that most of them were DNA binding, recognizing specific sequences in DNA. Very little literature on virtually all of them. There's only like a handful of them really that, that had much literature. They tended not to pop up in standard molecular biology studies. Uh, so Kim and I decided to focus on the Kim, Q 
Hughes was particularly interested in the DNA sequences that they recognized because he has this ambition of recreating gene regulation based purely on we were more interested in protein interactions. We decided to get together and focus on this one. And so we've been at this game for 10 years. Okay, so we focus on the transcription factors. And just to give you a little bit of a sense about them, they've been around for a long time in an evolutionary sense throughout the eukaryotes, but they've expanded in mammals and particularly in humans. So there's a lot of these guys. Um, and uh, one of the reasons there are so many that they've evolved through gene duplication and so on is because there's this, it, there's believed to be this kind of warfare during evolution between transposable elements and this family of transcription factors. A lot of them function as silencers of transcription. Uh, and those are particularly the ones that have grab domain. So they're organized in this way. The C terminal has these in finger domain and median numbers about nine. Okay, so there's a lot of them. And a zinc finger can recognize about three bases in DNA, sometimes four. Okay. If you multiply that by nine, you get 30 bases approximately worth of recognition, which is way too much. Okay, because uh, you know, we're now talking about a single site in, in a human, like a genome of the size of human. Um, so they only use some of these zinc finger domains to actually recognize DNA, but they use several of them to the the adjacent domains. In addition, you can have these kinds, these are the most common effector domains. There are crab domains in nearly half of them, a little over. And that recruits uh, Trim28, which involved, which brings in uh, histone methylation complex, which results in uh, those are the guys that are assigned. What's also known is scan domains, and there are fewer scan and BPDs than crab. And there are many, by the way, that don't have any other recognizable sizes and fingers and have a lot of distorted sequence. So BPDs have been known to interact with BPDs and scans with scan. Okay, so we wanted to look at DNA binding, but we also wanted to look at protein interactions, and eventually we were looking at the RNA interactions. And the way we decided to do that, we didn't have antibodies against all, you know, all these hundreds of proteins and it would take forever to make. Okay. So we decided to tag all the proteins and the tag we used was green fluorescent protein. And the strategy is here. Basically we put them into HEK293 cells. In, so at the flip and T-Rex focus, so we could reduce the cost of cycling. Okay. Then we could use antibody against the GFP tag for chip sequencing, for affinity, Purification of mass spectrometry and for iClip sequencing, if we wanted to get interactions with RNA, we could just turn them on and make it affects. Okay, so we started off with DNA binding and protein interaction. As I said, it's a collaboration with Tim Hughes, and the, the uh, DNA binding work, the chip sequencing done, was done by Frank. And my man was uh, actually doing a lot of. This doesn't show everything. This is what was in the paper in 2016. Now, we event eventually ended up being over 300 in terms of chip sequencing. And what you can see is that it's recognition elements. And compared to typical human transcription factor, all the other families, they actually do recognize very long sequences. Okay, I'm using long sequences for the description. Um, I won't say anything else except that in addition to this study showing that in general, they recognize specific DNA sequences. We also knew from this that they recognize specific DNA sequences directly because a protein can go in there, DNA binding protein, and can actually piggyback on something else that's actually doing the DNA recognition. Okay. But there's actually a zinc finger recognition code that the pin had a lot to do with working out. Okay. And uh, it, most of them follow the rules of the several zinc fingers in a row, if you take the recognition codes of those particular zinc fingers, then what you get is the chip sequencing motif. Okay, so it's direct DNA recognition. Okay, so then there was protein interactions, and that was a little bit surprising. Uh, we've gone past this. This, this was on the first a little over 100 of them. 
Um, we've now done like 300 of them. Um, but the bottom line is in the title of this slide, the uh, DNA interactions or the, the protein interactions are very heterogeneous in general. Now, as expected, you get interactions with transcription factors and chromatin remodelers, you know, this sort of thing that you would expect. And by the way, sometimes they interact with each other, and I'll get back to that in a bigger way later on. Okay, so that's expected, but you also get interactions with a bunch of other types of proteins, like these are RNA related ones, and actually these are meaningful interactions that, that, that we followed up on. Okay, and, and it turned out probably these things have existed evolutionarily in the human genome for a long time. And maybe they originally had the job of silencing transposable elements, but being there, they've been recruited to do all kinds of other jobs. A lot of them involved in RNA biology, which is really interesting. Okay, so um, let's see. All right, so why RNA biology? So what I've indicated here are a few famous members of this family. The very first one that was ever worked on was transcription factor DA, included, encoded by the GTF3 agent. The transcription factor for RNA polymerase 3 for 5 s ribosomal RNA. And that protein, in addition to recognizing a DNA element, recognizes the 5 s RNA, the gene product, okay, for feedback regulation. But it turned out that for each of these other ones, CPCF, YY1, and MILS2 were 1, there was also a paper that indicated that that protein interacted with RNA as well as DNA. SP1 is one of the people. Okay, so that brought us to the question of is RNA binding like DNA binding a universal property of these proteins? Okay. And we decided to look into that by following the strategy indicated on this slide called flip autoradiography. We did this for 150 proteins. This was done by a graduate student in my lab. And the idea was you use UV to cross the protein to RNA in vivo in the setting of GK293 cells. Okay, treat with DNA, so a little bit of bright in phase one. Okay, immunoprecipitate with uh, anti GFP antibody. Okay, then label the cross linked RNA by using polynucleotide kinase. Okay, because it's been covalently cross linked, you can now run it in, in a, an SDS gel. Okay, you'd have the position of the protein itself. And then because you've got RNA cross it would smear backwards up the gel and you get all this radioactivity in the autoradiogram, assuming that it actually crossed the RNA. So Nabil did this for 150 of these, of the, the about 20%. Okay? And this shows like a few representative panels and if I showed all of them slide after slide after slide, a lot. And generally speaking, so here's a couple of positive controls, transcription factor 3A cross-links, CTCF cross-links, as I said, GFP is a control, doesn't there? A bunch of other controls of other proteins, nuclear proteins, and here's a bunch of, of these same finger proteins, NNF, whatever, okay, and SP1. Uh, so, um, the bottom line ended up being that we did this for 150 and 148 out of 150 cross linked RNA. Just in general, they will cross linked RNA. And the question is for us was what are their roles in RNA? And uh, 150 out of 150 cross linked DNA? Are you eight? Did all cross DNA? We didn't look at cross linked the UV, of course, they do with from standard formaldehyde cross linking that you use for chips and right? Things. Then they do. We didn't look whether you would use cross linking. Okay. Actually, we took all of these things and heavily digested with DNAs to get rid of all potential cross -linking. Okay. So, roles in RNA biology. So, I've indicated particular ones that have various roles. And depending on the particular protein, we know that various ones regulate splicing through prime information, mRNA export, M6A modifications, um, mRNA stability. And actually, the formation of five prime cap. And finally, the last thing I'll get to is chromosome topology. So, anything to do with RNA, except this was not obvious that that had something to do with RNA. Okay, so in general, I showed you this, you know, do the cross link to run this gel in the clip autoradiography. Okay, but 
you have to treat with ribonuclease. If you didn't use any ribonuclease at all, the cross-linked RNA is very big and doesn't, most of it doesn't even enter the gel, the SDS gel. You want to treat with the right amount of ribonuclease in order to get reasonable size RNA fragments for the sequencing. Okay, so it could be something like this, and you cut out this stuff here. You can also see bands lower down in the gel because very often either this is a fusion protein, the PFP, and very often either in vivo or in the extract that you've made, you get fragmentation of the protein, so there's lower stuff, but we would always take the stuff that's above the point of protein sequencing. And the method we used was I clip sequencing. I stands for individual nucleotide. And the way that works, I'm, I had a slide which I decided to leave out the whole complicated procedure. And by the way, the deal who worked on this actually improved the whole procedure and has a protocols paper published on it. Um, make the whole thing more efficient. Um, but uh, one of the steps, you do a reverse transcription and the reverse transcriptase is going to go to the point where you have the cross-linking site and it's going to truncate right there. So these are cross link induced truncation sites, and that's how we map where the binding sites are for a single nuclear. All right, so uh, we end up doing these kinds of experiments. We're going to get clues about what each of these uh, RNA binding proteins does based on two things. One is where does it cross link on RNA? That's going to be important. Okay. And the other is what are its protein protein interactions? Like, does that give us some sort of sense? And in general, we followed up on ones where we had both sorts of information. Okay. We had a key protein interaction that told us what process it was participating in, and it was also going to the appropriate place. Okay, so um, nearly 100 proteins were subjected to iClip sequencing, and about 60 of these were using finger proteins. And then others, maybe the other 40s, is kind of marker proteins, you know, known splicing regulators, known cleavage and polyadenylation regulators. Those should be in recurrent ETRs, right? Splicing ones should be near splice junction, and so on. Okay. And, and that's kind of a sanity check if we're doing well. Those things should go to the right places and we should get the motifs that they're known to recognize in literature. And that was generally true. Okay. But then we also had these proteins to compare with when we. So um, here's an example of what you might get with all of these things. The red ones are using finger proteins, and others are color coded according to what sort of process they're regular. You can see a lot of them are in three prime UPRs, but that's not universal. It depends on the particular protein. Sometimes in coding sequences. And what's left out of here, by the way, are the introns, because if you're looking at, at splicing, I'll show you that in a moment. You put an intron here and you have the exons on your side, right? I'll show you that in a moment. But one of the questions that comes up frequently is do they bind to DNA and RNA in the same places? Okay. Well, what would you expect for a transcription factor? You'd expect it to bind DNA at promoters, and guess what? That's where they bond. Okay, if you do chip sequencing, you know we did chip sequencing, but here's the same kind of diagram but looking where. Are in DNA. And obviously, they're not here on DNA, with a couple of exceptions, which we haven't actually worked on. All right, so uh, DNA and RNA binding are generally different, okay? except in the case where we start looking at chromosome topology, and now we're looking at a different sort of DNA binding, and often the RNA binding is in the same place, which would be like. Yeah, I'll get to that. <laughs> I'm going to talk about individual cases now. Right? So far, it's been sort of global, but now I now I go more specific. Okay, I'm not starting off with M6A, so I'll, I'll get there. Okay, first thing is is alternative splicing. Okay. Now, when we started doing this and started realizing these things we've been splicing with, I have a colleague Ben Blanco who spent his entire scientific career doing genome-wide investigation of splicing. He was actually a postdoc in, in Cochart. Spent his whole career doing it. He's very good at it. Okay. And it turns out he had a student who was carrying out a screen in most cells, neuroclease cells. 
um, where the idea was they were looking at 100 different splicing events and they wanted to identify new regulators for splicing. So they used siRNAs for knockdowns. This um, long hand is a student. And um, she, so she used siRNAs to knock down, and she did that for all the known splicing plus other known RNA binding proteins, and she threw in a hundred zinc finger protein. And uh, so that's published quite a while ago. Okay, this is how we did that with over with a lot of data analysis. And um, uh, so known these crosses here are uh, happen to be positive controls. It's a muscle one protein, which is actually a known splicing agent. Okay, trim 20 white, remember that's the one that interacts well with life, comes out pretty strongly here. But also, all the other hits basically were not the other RNA binding proteins, classic RNA binding domains. It's actually the zinc finger protein, and this paper follows up on a couple of things. Okay, we were working in the human system, so here's now this diagram with the you know, drawn in the middle exons on the sides, and we have certain splicing regulators, which are dark blue here, and so on. But what we're particularly interested in is in you guys, like these zinc finger proteins that might play with splicing. So I'll show you, we followed up on, on two of these, ZNF654 and ZDP7A, these zinc finger proteins. U2AF1 is a known spliceosome subject that recognizes polyperimidine tracks. Splicing. Okay, so um, DBTD7A. I'm going to show you sort of in all of these individual cases a few generic kinds of experiments. In many cases, we've done a whole bunch of other experiments that I'm not going to show. Okay, so in terms of its interactions, what it pulls down is a bunch of splices on components. Okay, that's one of the reasons we focused on this guy. And here's an IP Western experiment showing this U2 SNRP subunit that in fact comes down with it. Um, if we look at uh, what splicing events it regulates by carrying out RNA sequencing, okay, then what we find is that when you knock it down, the main things are in intron retention patterns for about 100 years. Okay, that's the main phenomenon. Although sometimes it goes in the opposite direction. Then you can ask the question, well, does it bind RNA in this for these particular introns that it regulates? Is that where it preferentially binds? And that turns out to be true. So if we look at where the preferential binding is, we can see peaks of binding in the right regions. And if we look compared to ones that have no change, you have more binding. All right, let me go away from splicing and talk about alternative. Okay, so CPA factors are but generally speaking, they're in three prime EPRs. Okay, and we focused on these two SP1 and ZNF281. So I'm going to show you parallel experiments done on these two, but the SP1 work was published. Okay, and I'll just show you what that paper is and just sort of shows it. And there's a lot of experiments on SP1. Show you similar experiments done with ZNF281. Okay, so each of them is in this region over here where they bind the three prime EPRs. Remember, SP1 is this really classic DNA binding transcription factor. If we do chip sequencing, just like the literature says, it's in promoter and it recognizes you know the literature sequence in promoter. But if you look at RNA, it's here in a completely different place. Um, so anyway, we published the SP1 stuff last year, actually. And uh, so here is now looking at the RNA binding profiles of SP1 and ZNF281. You can see the big peak is in the three prime untranslated region. Um, both of them, incidentally, at the protein-protein interaction level, interact with subunits of cleavage factor one. And we think that they, by altering the activity of cleavage factor one, is how they change alternative cleavage of polyethylation. So I should say, I don't know if you know this, 
but for approximately half of all human genes, there's more than one cleavage site. Okay, so let's say there's a proximal site and a distal site. The proximal site is the first one after the coding sequence. It's distal. And what you see in both of these cases, when you knock down SP1 or ZNF281, you get lengthening, okay, rather than shortening. Which means that when the protein is present, it's causing a shift to a proximal site. When you take it away, you go to a distal site. By the way, just to say this, in rapidly growing cells and in cancer cells, characteristically, you get shifts to proximal sites. And during development, it goes the other way. Like, you know, just for a little bit of biological. Okay, the difference between SP1 and ZNF281 is for SP1, it's a lot of genes, and there's only about 10% that number in the case of uh, ZNF281. It's a smaller number of genes, but the same kind of thing. So then, you know, you end up with this sort of thing. Does it actually bind where it has an effect? And the answer is yes, in the case of SP1, and yes, in the case of ZNF281. All right, M6A modification is one task. Yeah, uh, M6A modification. So this is sort of a, a little bit of a, a summary slide of what happens with M6A modification on messenger RNA. Okay, so there's a writer complex that puts in the methyl group. The catalyst is subunit is methyl group, but it's actually a bigger protein complex that only shows three of the subunits. There are also two eraser proteins that are known to demethylate M6A. The first one that was discovered was FPO, and then later on, ALK-PH5 was discovered as, as demethylate. But then when you have this modification, there are reader proteins that recognize the M6A modification in RNA and recruit the apparatus for something or other, whether it's splicing or RNA stability, okay, whatever. Okay. Although then the question becomes, most of these reader proteins are members of the YPH family. There's some cytosolic ones and there's some nuclear ones. Okay. And the question is, why does a particular one of those recognize a particular M6A rather than another dog and recruit this rather than that? Okay. And so maybe there are other proteins that instruct them by reading neighboring RNA sequences telling them what to do. Okay. Um, one of the proteins I'll be talking about is YPHEF2, which is a cytosolic guide, and it recruits CCR0, a protein complex that deadenylates messenger RNA leading to RNA decay. And so now we're talking about RNA stability and therefore messenger RNA concentration. Okay, so um, now let me go over this sort of slide. So what we did was we oriented at the center M6A sites and asked whether any of these proteins that we get their sequencing on, do they tend to focus their crosslinking near M6A sites? And as can positive controls over here, you have these that directly recognize why uh, M6A, why THDF1 and 2. Okay. There, you know, over there. And uh, very tightly in there also is CDTV48, which is the next one I'm going to talk about. After that, I'm going to talk about ZNF121, which you can see is really kind of scattered all over the place, and it's actually not near, generally near M6A sites. But we work on it because it actually interacts with YPHDF2. So that's from the protein protein. Okay, so ZBTB48. ZBTB48, remember one of the demethylases, yeah, one of the demethylases was FDO. And ZBTB48 interacts with FPO. So here's a IP Western sort of experiment showing the interaction with FPO. The other thing is you can see that ZBTB48 really localizes right around M6A sites. Okay, here's random sites and here's M6A okay. So that's where it localizes. And this is from the protein protein. The FPO is one of those things. Okay. So then the question is in this work, and there's a whole lot of other experiments I'm not going to show you. Uh, is the binding FPO regulated by ZBTB48? 
1948. So we knock it down and sure enough, you get the new spine. And there's two kinds of sites that, that have six methyl adenosine. Okay? There's within the messenger RNA, but at the five prime end, when the first nucleotide is an adenosine, it starts with an A, then you can have M6A, but in addition, you have a methylation on the ribose spring. Okay, that's called M6AM, and there's a methylase that puts that one on. And we have another zinc finger protein that regulates that guy. Okay, that puts this group on over here. Right. But this one happens to regulate FDA. And here, this is an overexpression. We also have siRNA sort of thing. What you're seeing is that both overexpression of ZDP48 or FDO, both of them depress M6A or M6AM levels. Go in the opposite direction if you knock them down. Okay, and so this is the model of, of uh, ZDP48 for treating FDO. All right. Um, so this, this was a guy, ZNF121, okay, which is not really localized around M6A, but as it turns out, it actually uh, interacts with YKHDF2. And in the cytosol, where it is, so ZNF121 is both nuclear and cytosolic, okay? But if you do amino precipitation from cytosolic extract, unlike the nuclear, you get cell precipitation of YKHDF2, okay, which confirms the mass spec. And there's a lot of experiments here simply showing here the clip sequencing. Here's ZNF121 and YKHDF2. You can see they tend to be in three prime EPRs. But here, what we've done is localized uh, ZNF121 around YKHDF2 sites and it localizes there. But it localizes there regardless of whether there's M6A in the vicinity or no M6A in the vicinity. True either way. So if you look at, at um, uh, ZNF121 sites, there's always YTHDF2 there. Okay. If you look at YTHDF2 sites, there are ones where, where ZNF121 is present, and plays a role in recruiting it, and others where ZNF121 is absent, but there's M6A which recruited YTHDF2. Okay, so YKHDF2, which recruits the deadenolase, can be gotten there not only by M6A, but also directly by ZNF121. That's the bottom line of the model. And where both of the proteins are present, then if you get rid of uh, ZNF121, you alter the mRNA stability. But if it's just YKHDF2 there, but not ZNF121, it's the M6A doing the job, okay, then getting rid of ZNF121 doesn't affect stability. Okay. Um, so now another case of this methylation of RNA, but now we're not talking about M6A, we're talking about CMTR1. Okay. So in this clustering diagram, CMTR1 comes right up beside ZNF768, and they're both right at the five prime end of the RNA. And it turns out they interact with each other physically. So um, if you're looking at mRNA cap formation, in the cap, CMTR1 methylates this uh, oxygen on the ribose ring. Okay, and that's called cap one. So ZNF768 interacts with this guy. Now it turns out that that the way this guy is recruited, according to the literature is via interaction with the CTD repeats phosphorylated on serine 5 on RNA polymerase 2. Okay, but that's not the whole story. It turns out that ZNF768, this other protein, also has CTD-like repeats that are heavily phosphorylated on serine. Okay, and if we look at that, um, if we look at that, okay, and do the uh, co-IP experiment, if the repeats are there, then you get co-precipitation of CMTR1, which by the way stands for cap methyl transferase one, all right? But if we remove those CTD repeats, then we get rid of the interaction. Okay, so it's a second way of, of uh, getting rid of the Pardon me? How many repeats are there? I don't remember. I don't remember. 
I'm not sure if I ever knew that Neil ever told me that. Um, <laughs> it's not one, <laughs> but it's not 52 either. And they're, they're pretty, um, they sort of resemble the CTD repeats, but they're, they're, they're really, they look like mutated CTD repeats. Um, okay, so just showing you they have similar RNA binding profiles at the five front end. And if you overexpress uh, ZNF768, then you dramatically alter the methylation levels of those microbes. Okay, so uh, this is another one, uh, ZNF684, which interacts with nuclear export factor one. It's a key protein involved in mRNA export. Uh, however, it binds weakly to RNA and it has a bunch of cofactors that direct it to particular methylation. Turns out that ZNF684 is another one of these guys that does that sort of thing. We identified this interaction again by the mass spectrometry analysis. Um, and I'm only going to show you one sort of data analysis that, that uh, came out of this. Here, what we're looking at is its effect on messenger RNA nuclear to cytoplasmic ratios, we're talking about export here, as a function of the number of ZNF684 binding sites on the messenger RNA. And you can see that changes the more binding sites you have, the more you get and what it's on the time of the All right, no more about that. Now I'll go into uh, chromosome topology. Yes. <laughs> You're talking about ribosomes? You're talking about ribosomes? Yes. No, we have not. To ask what we, uh, about effects on translation, that sort of thing. No, generally we haven't done that. Um, one of the curiosities by the way, about one of these proteins that we've been working on. I can't remember which one. Go through this and, and think about it. But one of these that has a role in RNA biology that I'm talking about has another life in the mitochondria. Okay, because when we did the purification and mass spectrometry, we got the mitochondrial ribosomes in addition to all that, which looked kind of ridiculous, right? Uh, but then we just stain the cells and, and in addition to being in the nucleus, the thing is also has this punctate pattern in the cytosol. So we use MitoTracker, it's perfect co-localization. So it has some other role in the mitochondria. I, I think these zinc finger proteins have been borrowed from all sorts of things. Just barely scratched the surface. Okay, chromosome topology. So the thinking of this was based on the following observations. So I mentioned that these zinc finger proteins tend to sometimes interact with each other. Not sometimes, it's a lot of the time. So we got a, all of this out of the purification of mass spec. And these are color coded according to their auxiliary domains. What you can see is these pink guys like to interact with each other. Those are the ones with crab domain. Remember I said that <coughs> Uh, scan domains like to interact with each other. Those are the blue guys, or the ones with both crab and scan are yellow. You can see that bunch of guys over here. Okay. And BTBs like to interact with each other. Well, you can see that happening in various places. Okay. And finally, by the way, the ones, the green ones, are the ones that don't have any external domain. Actually, they tend to prefer each other, but they also have a lot of interaction. They not, may not even be told that it works. And this is sort of summarized over here. C2H2 only tend to go for C2H2 only. Crabs go to crabs. Crab scans go to scans and crab scans. Scans go to scans and crab scans. And these go to yeah. So, but this brings up an issue. Remember, these proteins individually recognize long motifs. Usually a lot of transcription factors 
will be heterodimers where each member of the heterodimer recognizes a short guy like six base pairs. Okay. Together it's like 12 with some separation. These guys, one of them all by itself recognizes a long motif. Right? So it's not obvious why they would do this unless by getting together and each one binding a separate piece of DNA, they're helping to create a DNA. And that's the way we started thinking about it. Of course, they could be blinding side by side on DNA if they could be cooperative. So one way of thinking of it, that sort of cooperative binding is this sort of model one at the top where they're side by side, but also they could just be creating this DNA loop and maybe creating some vector protein that so, so Ernest Radovani in my lab, who was asking this sort of question, first asked this, if they have a protein-protein interaction compared to all the ones where we did not detect the protein-protein interaction, do they tend to bind side by side? And he called this uh, degree of overlap in cis. And that was generally true. The interacting pairs tended much more to be side by side than the others. And here, what he's done is they have to be within 50 base pairs of each other, he extended the peak summits of the gypsy. Here he's got all the way up to a thousand base pairs. It's still true, but of course, at a thousand base pairs, you're now creating a DNA. Okay. But he then asked the question using <coughs> the views. Well, normally high, high C data, but when we first did this analysis, he used chia pet data, which is like high C, except that uh, this was where RNA polymerase was found. So you do an immunoprecipitation first with uh, antibody against RNA polymerase two. Okay. And now you're looking at two ends of DNA that come together. And he's asking if the proteins interact physically, perform some kind of heterodimer, do they tend to be at opposite ends of this DNA loop? And the answer again is yes, there's that sort of tendency. Okay. Um, uh, this degree of overlap in trends. And this is for both interchromosomal long range interactions and a smaller number of. And these things correlate with each other. So, to the extent that a pair tends to bind side by side, they also tend to bind the opposite ends of DNA loops. Okay, now when one talks about DNA loops, people are used to, for the last decade, looking at it. Uh, oh, this was something else that we had done. Remember, these are transcription factors. So we identified a lot of interactions of these individual proteins with cofactors. Okay. So for a given cofactor, there's some of these same finger transcription factors that bind it, and most others that don't. And so we could ask, um, do the cofactors that bind to the transcription factors tend to be co-localized on DNA? And the answer is yes, compared to ones where they don't interact. So, so here's what I was going after. So of course, uh, last decade of work has indicated, and now especially using IC experiments, that uh, human chromosomes are organized into chromosomal domains, okay? which here they're called, they're, they can often call topologically associated domains, here we're calling them contact domains. The idea is within one of those domains, you have call them DNA DNA interactions, you tend to not have DNA DNA interactions coming from somewhere outside the domain. You can think of these border regions between the DNAs as insulators preventing interactions from coming outside the domain into the Key insulator protein in there is CTCF together with the cohesive one. So we call these places in between contact domain borders. Okay. And the exact border would, you know, the computation that comes with the exact border, but you know, it's within the single piece of it. Um, so what Ernest did, since we had all this chip sequencing data for the same finger proteins, is he asked. If you compare their binding compared to all these contact domains along chromosomes, where do you find them? And the answer is, it turns out, 
if these contacts are main borders. It's brought over here, here. And if here the domain extension has been, you know, from the center only 250 base pairs and 500,000 and so on. And you can see that there's a large number of them that are heavily concentrated there. And near the top of the pile is CTCF, but there's a whole lot of others that tend to be focused in contact. Um, so I'm really talking, trying to talk to you here about RNA interactions. So we can ask, well, we have this clip sequencing data for 60 of them, not as many as the DNA binding ones, but we have 200. Okay. But we have enough to ask, do they generally interact with RNA near these points? And so here's that. And here, okay, so if they interact with RNA, they may also, in the individual case, interact with DNA, and that is usually the case. Okay. That was something that was first discovered and published several years ago with the transcription factor YY1. Where it's shown that interactions with RNA tend to act as a kind of kinetic sink, so that the protein comes off DNA, the RNA keeps it there long enough for it to go back on. The RNA volume helps the DNA. Well, in many cases, that's true. You get this focus binding over there. But we also looked at ones where the protein was interacting with RNA and there was no DNA binding in the vicinity, not within 50 kilobytes. And it's still true. And that small one over here. See over here. So then we wanted to ask, well, does do these, does the presence of one of these proteins have something to do with the insulation property of these borders, okay, like CTS, CTCF does. And so there was an experiment in the literature where YY1 was gotten rid of by attaching a degron to it. Okay. And then doing a high C experiment to look at you know, the, the, uh, the domain organization chromosome that the results of that, and also then allowing it to come back and so on. So we reanalyzed those that data uh, in the context of where YY1 binds on DNA and where it binds on RNA to ask if there's a relationship between the DNA binding and RNA binding and the insulation. And the loss of insulation means that you're getting RNA loops that are coming from outside into domain. What you would expect if YY1 had something to do with it is if YY1 is at the borders and you get rid of it, then you should get loops coming in. But for the other domains that don't have, which is most of them that don't have YY1, then there shouldn't be an effect. Or if there is an effect, it should be small. Um, so let me show you that. This is the last slide I'm going to show you. So here you have binding on DNA of YY. Okay. So if it's at the contact domain borders, okay, then on average you get five more loops that come into the average domain and get rid of YY. For the one borders that don't have Y, you basically don't get anything coming. Where they're binding to RNA. But of course, also DNA, you get the same result. But if it's RNA only, the statistics are a little worse, but again, it's the same result. If, if it's on the borders binding only to RNA, again, you lose insulation. But for the control guys, you don't. Okay, so it appears that YY1 plays a role in insulating these domains, whose borders it binds, whether it binds at the DNA level or at the RNA level, or both. Okay, so this whole thing has been about the roles of these proteins and RNA binders. I hope I convinced you that they do a lot in RNA biology. Um, this work, as I said, was initially a collaboration with the Hughes lab, 
and mass spectrometry early on was a collaboration with Andrew. Um, more recently, for splicing stuff and uh, all the, well, the sequencing stuff, we had collaborations with uh, Ben Blanco's lab. Most of what I showed you was done by the real but in individual cases, uh, Nuchat and, and uh, Geo had roles with the particulars in the finger protein. And the stuff on chromosome topology was done by uh, Herbistrat. Um, Jale Jean's lab, given the new help, so did the main bulk of the company. Okay, so. Thank you for listening to all of that. Yes, well, actually, now that you mention that, Rick Young's lab published a paper recently, a months ago in Molecular Cell, okay, which essentially what they were doing was they were pulling out RNAs across something and asking what proteins were bound to the RNAs, that, you know, the messenger RNAs that they were pulling out. And the answer was a whole bunch of transcription factors, not just in finger protein, in all the other categories. Now, it's not like every trend about every transcription factor, but scattered across all the things. They even identified a short arginine rich motif, which tended to be present, but seemed to be important to the RNA. By the way, we checked our work on SP1, where we had the patients and so on, and sure enough, we have this peak we saw it was in finger bone. So, uh, yes, it's probably a property of transcription factors in general. I'm not saying every transcription factor, but a whole bunch of them. Probably the zinc finger proteins, probably universally, but for a lot of the other factors also. And probably mostly that has something to do with their function with transcription factors. Okay. But they've also been borrowed for. Are in for other roles in our uh, yeah, I was quite surprised by the S phase basically. Like what's the how underlying the, biology and yeah, biology. and how what's that the, could be regulated. Yeah. So on. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think in each of these cases, it's more than 700 of these proteins. Each of these cases would require a great deal of detailed experimentation to figure out that's a big problem. And so <laughs> We focused on individual cases, mostly motivated by individual protein protein interactions, which gave us a clue about what RNA, pro, RNA biology process is going on. Um, but I think they're all involved. Yeah, so Oh, oh, okay, so actually, in, in the case of our, that particular transcription factor, we happen to know is both nuclear and cytosolic, which means it could be still bound to the, the RNA once it gets out, because it is found in cytosol, but that doesn't prove the point. That's all I can say. We don't really know that it's specifically in the cytosol bound to the RNAs that it is involved in this.
That could be true, but I don't actually know. The closest we came to that was, you know, where you have uh, an interaction with YPFTH2 in the cytosol. Then recruits CCR not, which leads to mRNA contamination. Okay. But that's not the same as directly regulating. Just have not specifically. Oh, sorry, just one more thing. Most of what I've talked about is activities of these proteins in the nucleus. Cytosolic translation. Sorry. Oh, you mean not mRNA? Okay, so in general, they tend to preferentially interact with messenger RNAs. Okay, but that's a generality. Okay, and I think there are ones that probably are working on long Don't think you have just total specificity of messenger RNA. It's just, that's the tendency overall. That's how you sort of focus the analysis. We kind of avoided the non-coding RNA part of it, okay? Because it's a minority part of it, but I think it's probably important. Right. Oh, well, they often interact with other RNA binding proteins. I showed you many exa individual examples of that. Right, where they interact it was an RNA binding protein. Involved in like like HDL, right? involved in a particular process on messenger RNA or pre messenger RNA right? is an RNA binding protein. Um, so there was a lot of focus on that. What's the biggest surprise or something that was found in the different process that you think is real? I mean, something that I haven't talked about. Yeah, no, I haven't. I, I I'm not fighting it. No, I know, I know. What's <laughs> well, that chat? But I mean, what the protein protein interaction? Oh, yeah, I think that's your next part. Remember the interaction with mitochondrial ribosomes? Yeah. That's a good yeah. You know. <laughs> and, and we thought, yeah, this has got to be some sort of weird artifact, right? And then you find just do immunofluorescence, and there it is in mitochondria. Right. <laughs> and that's it. And, and talking about the PCI coordination, you have shown Ben would not. The ones connected to SPICY functionally were knocked down. You had one example of the corresponding protein physically associated with the SPICY machinery. Yeah. How how many of the other ones are when they're functionally connected to SPICY, physically connected to the SPICY machinery? There's one, but how many are other? So ones? so we haven't done the generalized kind of experiment when you say functionally connected to splicing. In order to know that, you have to knock it down or knock it out. Do RNA deep RNA sequencing, which by the way is expensive, okay. and in order to analyze effects on splicing. Okay. So we haven't pursued that because it's a very expensive way. Of but you've looked at a number of them, haven't you, in that regard? Um, Isn't that what Ben has been doing? They did a they did a different kind of screen where they were looking at a hundred specific splicing events and a hundred specific zinc fingerprints. And they find that these zinc finger proteins often re regulate one or another of these. Okay, so my question is the ones that do regulate that, how many of them are physically associated to the splicing machine? You had one okay, example. Okay, okay. So here's the problem those were mouse experiments. Okay. The evolutionary conservation is not that great for these guys. And all our protein protein interaction stuff is for the human protein. So, yeah, we haven't tried to ask that question. And the last question, 
you're showing the PPI is correlated with where they are localized on the DNA at the end of your talk. You have a similar plot for the RNA, like if they're you know physically connected by mass spec, are they more, more likely, like you see with DNA, to be associated with a similar type of long term RNA? Is there a strong we, correlation? We, we haven't done that as an overall thing okay. to take the PPIs that we have for RNA binding proteins explicitly okay, and ask how correlated their binding sites are. Right. We, we, we should bear in mind that we have not done iCRIP sequencing on all of these RNA binding proteins, which by the way, is its own iCLIP sequencing is also not a cheap experiment. Okay. So Nabil having done a hundred of those, that's a lot. We don't have the kind of money that let's say <laughs> ENCODE had to, you know, Xingyao did a few hundred of the classic right. RNA. Uh, we don't have that kind of money. Where are the zinc finger transcription factors made? Which ribosomes you mean? Yeah. I have no idea. Not a clue. Can't ask that question. <laughs> I would imagine they're not secreted into the ER, but that wouldn't make much sense. But generally speaking, they're either cytosolic or nuclear. Thank God for your time. Like I said, he's around here.